Today, we're going to continue our study on the we are. Who are we in Christ? We've gone through a number of descriptions of who we are in Christ. We started out with, we are citizens of heaven, citizens of the kingdom. We looked at our adoption in Christ. We are adopted. We looked at how we're called being chosen, holy, and beloved. Very awesome things to have those three words describe us. Last week, what did we talk about? Anybody remember? This is the test portion of the Sunday morning service. <laughs> we talked about being an ambassador. Ambassadors of Jesus. Ambassadors of Christ. What does it mean to be an ambassador? And I kind of went through the example from the U.S. Embassy website of what it meant. And then we talked about how we are to be that way as a believer in Christ. Ambassador. Today we have a day of celebration. A day of talking about what it is to be redeemed. Jerry and I changed the sign out front that says, We are the redeemed. What does that mean? As we prayed at the cross earlier this morning, and I said, what do you think it means? What do you think of when you hear the word redeemed? And I said, I think of coupons. Because <laughs> on the top of every coupon it says, can be redeemed at. And so that's the first frame of mind you know, that I had. And Alita jumped in and said, you're not crazy. I think about the same thing. And I'm like, awesome. Confirmation. You know, with that. But what does it mean? What does it mean in a Christian sense? And so we'll talk about that today. So I want to start with Psalm 111 today. Psalm 111. I could have picked a lot of Psalms for this. It's amazing to me when you look through and, and read through the Psalms, how many of them are similar but are written in different circumstances. This Psalm 111 says, Praise for God's tender care. That's the description this study Bible has for this particular Psalm. The word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. In the company of the upright and in the assembly, great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear him. He will remember his covenant forever. He has made known to his people the power of his works in giving them a heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All of his precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. And then verse 9, He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. The word of the Lord from Psalm 111. Let's pray. Oh Father, we do thank you for who you are. We do lift your name up in praise. We do lift your name up for your compassionate care of us. Oh, to be able to see our life all played out just like playing a movie. All of those times in our life where you've been there and we haven't noticed you. Where you have lifted us up. Where you have comforted us. Where you have provided for us. And we could see the whole story from birth to where we are right now. All the wondrous things that were part of our life where you enveloped us in your love and care. You brought us health when we needed it. 
You brought us provision when we needed them. You brought us resources when we needed to provide for ourselves and our families. You brought us joy in difficult circumstances. You brought us love when we didn't know what love was. You brought us to the point in our life where we needed to recognize that we needed a Savior. And then you brought us the Savior. You've always been there. And you always have comforted us. And it's this manifold love that you've shown us. This great grace that you've provided us. That brings us to a point when we come to the worship service and just want to praise your name. And we dedicate a whole service of prayer to talk to you. And of praise to worship you and to thank you for all that you've done for us and for who you are. You are worthy to be praised, Lord. So worthy. And we thank you for your love and care. Hear our words of song today. Hear the spoken word orated by me, but directed by you. Let us have joyous celebration in being a part of your kingdom in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Reading out the word from Isaiah 62, verses 11 and 12. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed. Oh, hold on. Let me back, let me back up. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Father in heaven, we come to you to thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Thank you for the word. May you open our hearts to the word as pastor gives your word through the sermon for us. Bless pa the pastor as he gives this sermon. May we all take what you want us to take into our hearts forever and pass your word unto others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, brother. That great passage from Isaiah 62, part of the last few chapters of Isaiah, and it's talking about the future of Jerusalem. The future of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the great city, the holy city. The one that will be lit up in the future. There was a time period, as I was telling the men in our Bible study yesterday, Jerusalem was a wasteland. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be in Jerusalem. There was nothing there. The walls were gone. No temple, no people, scattered all over the place. A place that cattle roamed, a horrible place. But in the future, this depiction in Isaiah 62 of a Jerusalem that will be beautiful, magnificent, completely filled, filled with God's people, a place of celebration, a place of joy, a place of great song, of great wealth, a great future ahead for Jerusalem. We've seen some of that start. We've seen the Jerusalem, the people come back as the Lord has been bringing his people back to Jerusalem. We've seen wealth show up in Jerusalem. We've seen industry come to Jerusalem. Number two pharmaceutical nation on the planet after the United States of America. Great skills in that area. Security, great skills in that area. Wealth showing up. 
eventually it will be the most wealthy nation on the planet. Can you imagine that? From 1948 to 2022, 74 years since it's been a nation again. And it is growing. And of course the people are showing up, so it's spreading out wider and wider away from the old city and they're taking territory and they're building settlements because so many of the Lord's people are showing back up to Jerusalem. And yet, at its heart, it's still a pagan nation. They are still looking for their Messiah. We are not looking for our Messiah. We know who the Messiah is. We know who the Messiah was and what he did. We are on the inside. We have knowledge that they don't have. Now there's a growing community there of what we call Messianic Jews. Jews who have known Jesus, who are redeemed, who are part of the church. And they are back there trying to evangelize their people. And it's a building, growing process that is going to happen from now until the Lord comes in glory. And if we read the scripture and we see the Lord coming back in glory and we read passages like Isaiah 53, passages like Zechariah 12.10, they will look upon him who they pierced. They will mourn for him as an only son. They will realize he is the Messiah. They will know him. And then they will joy in him. And in that day, Isaiah 62 will be fulfilled. Those words that Mr. Hawk read to us. The Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. He's coming on the clouds as we sang. He's coming. And all will see him. Today as we look at our view of those events, knowledgeable views of those events, we know who he is. And we deal with this term called redeem or redemption. And I was talking about that a little bit earlier in my introduction. I think of coupons because on the top of a coupon it says you can redeem at this particular place or this particular store or the s and stamps that says you know redemption value of this is there's an amount and so if you think about redeem and redemption and coupons and s and stamps you know there's got to be some tie in there's a financial tie in there there's an exchange there's a transaction there's a price that was paid and need to be paid because if you turned in s and stamps, you got a discount on buying things. Or you got things for free if you had enough of s and stamps. And for those of you who don't know what that is, I understand that. But I'm old. <laughs> I remember what they are. Coupons may not be used anymore, but most people will realize if you have a coupon, you get something for a lesser price. The manufacturer wants you to buy it's product and therefore it'll give you 50 cents off or a dollar off or 250 off a particular product and so you get a credit or a value from redeeming a coupon you paid less <laughs> I love the concept of redemption I love to explain it because it is in so many areas of the Bible it's like you can pick verses from all over the New Testament that talks about redeem or redemption. You can pick passages all over the Old Testament and it talks about redeem and redemption. It's such a common concept. So much that all the authors have written about this. And then when you ask the guy on the street, what does it mean to be redeemed? They look at you and go, what? Redeemed? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Not taught. Not understood, not communicated. Maybe in this challenge for us today is to take that word redeem and redemption and take it to the streets and explain what it means. But as we survey 
what we are going to go through today. We survey the scriptures of this. There's several facets of what redeem is. The first is the intention to redeem. God in his earliest part of his plan intended to have a people set out for him that he was going to redeem. We talked about this in the men's Bible study. He gave Abraham this vision in Genesis 12 and he says, I am going to make you a holy nation. I am going to make your offspring like the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky. You're going to have a people that come from you and you're going to have a land that I'm going to give you and we're going to call that land the promised land and your people are going to live there. Your offspring is going to live there and they are going to be special and holy and set apart. They're going to live differently. Redemption was always part of the plan. Paul writes about this in the New Testament, Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 7. He writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. We have been chosen by him before the world was created. To what end? That we would be holy and blameless before him. That we would live differently that we would be set apart, that we would be blameless. You know what that word blameless means in our common language? Perfect. That we would be perfect. Any of you perfect? Anybody going to stand up and say, I'm perfect? We wouldn't take that bold step, right? There are only a few people in the world that might take that bold step as they look in the mirror and see how pretty they are or how much wealth they have. Man, he's the perfect guy. Now, I'm pretty sure that Sidney said that about Don back in the past. He's the perfect guy. How many times have we heard that on TV? Oh, he's the perfect guy. He's the perfect woman. He's the perfect son. He's the, she's the perfect daughter. That's the perfect house. <laughs> we love to use this word. But Paul uses this word as a future state. Holy, set apart, blameless. Matthew 5, 48, the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount says, You shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And by that statement, he said, both as a bar to be hit, a hurdle to be jumped over. He says the only way you're going to get into heaven is if you're perfect. Why? Because the Heavenly Father is perfect. And he doesn't want non-perfect people in heaven, because in heaven everything is perfect. What do we do with that? If we're not perfect, and yet to get into heaven we have to be perfect, we're in a bit of a pickle, as they say. We're in a tough situation. But going back to that verse I was reading from Ephesians 1, he writes, Paul does, In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. He said, you guys are going to get into heaven because you've been beloved. And I'm going to make you holy. And I am going to make you blameless. And you are going to be perfect. And you are going to get into the kingdom. And you're going to walk into heaven knowing your name was written in the book of life, knowing that your name was written before the foundation of the world, and you're going to walk in. No debate, no argument, no invoice that you have to pay on walking in. You're going to even approach the gates. The gates are going to open for you like those wonderful doors at the Dollar General that open and allow you to walk right in. You don't even have to touch the door. You might have an announcer on the inside, coming in, Mr. Don Fouts, so that everybody knows in heaven who's going to arrive. Maybe family members show up. 
hey, I didn't think you had a chance. <laughs> but you know what? You're here. I saw your name on the board today. In my room that the Lord prepared perfectly for me, there's a board up there and it's a list of names of who's showing up today. And I recognize yours. And I wanted to be here. We don't know if that's going to happen or that kind of an event. But we do know is that we walk in because we've been prepared for and are and have been intended to be redeemed. And I have great joy in knowing that my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that in heaven there's a place waiting for me. But what happens if somebody is not perfect? We are born in sin. We were born in original sin. That's a tough concept to explain to some people when they ask the pastor, come on, that baby that I just bore, just was born, just came out of my wife seven days ago. Look at her. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. Look at the smile. Look at the cheeks. Look at that wonderful set of eyes that are looking at me as she reaches and squeezes for my little pinky as I hold her. You know what, Pastor? She's perfect. Well, my guess is that baby is going to cry if you don't do something. <laughs> Imperfection starts showing up early. The baby is the most selfish creature. They need constant attention. And if they don't get it, what do they do? They cry. They yell. They scream because they want to be taken care of. Original sin shows up early. And then when they're age, let's say 18 months to 24 months, and you tell them, Johnny, don't cross that line. You know Johnny walks up to the line, right? <laughs> looks at the line. Looks back. Is anybody watching me? And jumps over the line. Well, look, nothing happened to me. I didn't get yapped at by my parents for jumping over the line. That was a bunch of hooey. I can go anywhere I want. I'm free. I'm perfect. And it just goes down and downhill from there. Right? We love the grandkids. We love our kids. We love to see the great-grandchildren run. But it doesn't take long before those of us who know realize they're not perfect. <laughs> Because they've got an issue. They've got a sickness. It's a sin sickness. It's selfish. And it shows up in their life. And it shows up in our life. Even thus, our old babies, who may be 60 or 70 or 80 years old, we still have those baby-like qualities. Hopefully they're on the decline, but they're still there. Paul in Romans wrote, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nobody that is perfect in humanity. Paul also wrote in Romans 6.23, the wages of that sin is death, eternal separation. Sin separates us from God. There is a divide that is there because we are not perfect and he is perfect. This beautiful passage in Isaiah 59, very, very clear before Isaiah talks about the wonderful joy of returning to Jerusalem that John read a part of earlier today. Isaiah 59, he writes, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken falsehood, your tongue mutters wickedness. Anybody ever lied? Told a lie? Told a fib? <laughs> Didn't quietly complete the whole truth? didn't quite give it all, maybe only gave half of the story, half of the situation. There's a lot of good reasons. A lot of people do white lies, little white lie. Well, I didn't want to hurt somebody, so I didn't want to tell them their baby was ugly. You know, 
I'm just going to lie. Sometimes it happens naturally. Sometimes it happens because of a cause. What Isaiah is saying, your lips have spoken falsehood. One falsehood. One tongue that mutters something evil or wicked to somebody else. You're now guilty. Guilty before a perfect God. All it takes is one. Break one commandment and you break them all. <laughs> Nobody is perfect. He goes on in Isaiah 59 and says, No one sues righteously. No one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion. They speak lies. They conceive mischief. They bring forth in iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs. They weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, a snake breaks forth. Their webs are, will not become clothing, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are iniquity. An act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Devastation and destruction is in their highways. If you watch TV for a couple of hours in an afternoon and think about all the thoughts of evil because the characters portrayed do evil things. The adversary conditions us with programming on the TV and our thoughts are turned to iniquity. It's, it's easy to see. You put kids in front of a set of cartoons like my mom did for me early on in life. And I see you can buy any Acme product and it'll be delivered right away. I see that you can fall off a cliff and then you're okay in the next scene. Watch the Roadrunner for a little bit if you remember those days. Or Elmer Fudd where he gets shot by a musket and he's in the next scene. He's all okay. He's just programming that we start very early on of things that are evil and it doesn't get any better from that. Isaiah continues, they do not know the way of peace. There is no justice in their tracks. They have made their paths crooked. Whoever treads on them does not know peace. And that's the summary of that section. How many of you know somebody right now in your life that can say they don't have peace in their life? They are all over the place. <laughs> they're frustrated, they're angry, they're mad at God. They don't have any peace. They feel like everything is against them. They say, woe is me. They say, God hates me and therefore I hate him. There's no peace at all in their life. Why is that? They're separated from God. They're separated from him. They choose that. They're always anxious. They're feeling doomed. Woe is me. There's a reason for that. They've chosen separation from God. They are not redeemed. In Micah 3.4, he talks about these individuals. They will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them because they have practiced evil deeds. Micah is talking about rulers, rulers of nations at that point. They've done evil things. They want to run that way. They cry out to the Lord when things don't go well for them and he won't answer. God will not answer. He hears, he won't answer. And I wrote in the notes, God only hears one prayer from a sinner. There's only one he will hear and answer. What is it? Lord, save me. That's the one thing he will hear. That's the one thing he will answer. He will only answer if they repent. And we talked about what repent means. Change your mind. Metanoeo in the Greek. Think a different way. I'm thinking this way. Now I'm going to think this way. That's what it means. And the only prayer he'll hear is, Lord, save me. 
I had family members before. Maybe you've had family members in the past. You watch them all the time. He's like, oh boy, I just pray that the Lord will take care of me through this situation. I'm like, well, he would if you were had a relationship with him, maybe. <laughs> but you don't. I pray every day. Do you now? <laughs> Get any answers to those prayers? <laughs> well, I'm still alive. Okay. That's something to be said for. That means you still have a chance. But you're separated from God. How do you know that, Pastor? Because I watch your life. <laughs> I watch what you say. I see soft things out of your mouth on Monday, and on Tuesday, it's not soft things out of your mouth. You're cursing up a storm, and you're angry with people who parked in your parking place. <laughs> really? <laughs> and you're calling them all sorts of names because they opened their car door and have to make a little scratch that's undetectable unless you got a microscope right up on it. Right? That's what people are like out there, especially in the big city. God only hears one prayer, Lord, save me. But there's an answer to living in despair. There is a way to find peace. This is our message to the people in the community that don't have any peace in their life. Paul records this in a letter to Titus, Titus 2. 11 to 14, this is what Paul writes, For the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, just live right, righteously and godly in the present age, looking forward to the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us, from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And there you have a definition of redeem. He gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Our deeds make us not perfect. He died for us to redeem us such that God the Father will see us as perfect and therefore we have entrance into heaven. Jesus gave himself to redeem us. Redeem. That word in the Greek is lutruo. Beautiful word in the Greek. Here's what it means to pay a ransom for someone. But that's a better definition, which I love than I have in the notes. To restore someone or something back to its rightful owner. Let's say you have a child and your child is kidnapped. And you search all over the county for them. And the police eventually find your child three blocks away in a house. And you go back over there. And the police lead your child out to you and the child runs and jumps into your arms and you grab and hold them tight to you, redeemed to its rightful owner. Play that out for us with our life of sin and Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We are returned because of that ransom paid for Jesus on the cross. And we are returned and restored to our rightful owner. Who is our rightful owner? Who is the one who created us? We are owned by God the Father. We are sons and daughters of the King. But we were kidnapped by our sin and held away from Him for a time the Jews were enticed to walk away, kidnapped by the adversary who runs the world system. The world systems are run by the adversary. The Bible says everything is in the hand of the evil one. There is no institution not in the hands of the evil one in the United States of America or any other country except one institution. What's that? The true church. And I say the true church 
because there are a lot of churches that are in the hands of the evil one. And you can see it up close. And there may be some down the street from us, right here. There may be some in the capital. There's certainly a lot of them in the nation. And there are many of them that show up on Sunday afternoon TV. Churches in the hands of the evil one. People in the hands of the evil one. Standing in pulpits, not preaching the truth. Preaching a different gospel that Paul said, don't do that. Attack that. Challenge that. Oh, but when we challenge somebody in the church like that, you guys aren't loving. You guys have hate speech. <laughs> the Lord will judge those who think that they're part of the kingdom and lead people astray. He will judge them harshly. But redeem has a financial sense to it, a ransom that was paid Returning to the rightful owner. We have been returned to the rightful owner because sin has been dealt with. The price has been paid. Paul goes on in that Ephesians passage, Ephesians 1.7, For in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. We have redemption because of his blood. And that means to us forgiveness of those trespasses that would keep us separated from God. He writes to the Galatians, Galatians 1, 3-4, Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Rescue. Another word for redeem. So we've seen ransom, and we've seen rescue. These are great terms for us. And I wrote in the notes, Christ's sacrifice allowed for him to be the mediator. He is our great high priest who intercedes for us. When Satan, as I was mentioning yesterday to the men, accuse us in front of the Father's throne... Jesus Christ is there saying their blood, my blood covers their transgressors. You cannot judge them for their sin. He is the one who mediates for us. The writer of Hebrews talks about this in Hebrews 9, 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through a greater, more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, not of this creation, not through the blood of goats, not through the blood of calves, but through his own blood. And he entered into that holy place once and for all. And then the writer says, having obtained eternal redemption. Once for all. One sacrifice for all. What does that mean to us? Christ is not still on the cross sacrificing himself for us. When you look at somebody and they're part of a different denomination and they have a crucifix with Christ on the cross, I usually ask them, is he still there? Did he do everything he did on the cross once for all or is he still there? And some people rooted in ideology says he's still there. He never left the cross. I said, he's off the cross. It was once for all. He did that. And he obtained eternal redemption for everybody who is his. Continuing on in that Hebrews 9 passage with verse 15. For this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant. Since a death has taken place for redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. Those who have been called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. He gave the Ten Commandments. Part of the first covenant. Follow the rules and you'll be all right. But nobody could follow the rules. Nobody could be perfect with all the commandments. Nobody could keep them all. There was only one man who could keep them all. And that was the person of Jesus Christ. The only one. Never broke the commandments. If you're perfect, you can do that. I remember a guy named the rich young ruler who walked up to Jesus and said, How do I get this eternal life? And Jesus said, follow the commandments. 
That was supposed to guide us, guide the Jews to know that there's no way they could keep them all. And the blood of sacrifice of goats and doves and calves and all of those things was to show when you break the commandments, something had to die. And yet that rich young ruler said, from my beginnings of my life, I did all of these things. I killed them all. No breaking of any commandments. I had a guy told me two years ago that I've kept all the commandments. I said, all of them? And then he said, well, there's one I broke, this one with adultery. But, but I'm good other than that. Well, okay, well, you break one, you break them all, right? Hebrews 9.27, and after that comes judgment. So are you going to go up there and say, 9 out of 10 ain't bad? <laughs> Is that your pitch before the Lord of glory? 9 out of 10 ain't bad? And he's going to go to Matthew 5.48, and he says, Thou shall be perfect. You broke one, you're not perfect. Out. You want to be in that situation? <laughs> no way you can do it. We were enemies, I wrote in the notes, and sinners. We talked about that a little last week enemies. Jesus' sacrifice for us provided the payment to satisfy the wrath of God so we can walk in his stead and say, I plead the blood of Jesus. In Romans 5, 8-10, to God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If it was not for his sacrifice on the cross, we would still be enemies. But by his doing, Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.30, By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He redeemed us. He paid the price. On the cross, do you remember the last words Jesus said? It is finished. Jesus spoke in Aramaic on the cross. That was the language of the day. Had a lot of debate with a few Jewish guys who said that he spoke Hebrew, but he probably spoke Aramaic from there. It was translated into Greek. And I use Greek because Greek is used for the basis of our English Bibles. They all came from the Greek language. That word in the Greek is tetelestai. You know what it means? It means paid in full. That's what he said on the cross. It is finished means paid in full. In business transactions in the Greek community, they would say tetelestai when they took money and gave a product. Tetelestai, your debt is paid in full. If you owed somebody something, now when you pay off your mortgage on your house, if you still have one, or if you pay off your new car, I want you to scream tetelestai. Paid in full. They had mortgage note burning parties back in the day. Anybody remember those where you paid off your house, you had a party at your house, you took the mortgage note, you put it in the fireplace, you lit it on fire? I wonder if anybody yelled to tell us die <laughs> or it is finished. But that's what it means. His life for ours, paid in full. In Peter, Peter talks about this, 1 Peter 1, 17 to 21. He says, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay on the earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold or from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. You didn't pay money for it. You don't pay by living perfectly because there's no way you can. But how were you redeemed? With the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. It wasn't for money. Sin required death. And he died for us. 
He is the only way, I wrote in the notes. Where do you find that in the Bible? John chapter 14, Jesus himself said, what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the only way. I have great conversations with people who tell me there are many ways to God. There are many ways to God, Pastor. You're only talking about one of them. I'm like, do you know God? <laughs> there are many ways there. Do you understand the fact that you grow up, you have sin in your life, and God can't stand sin? He doesn't want it in his presence. He can't have it in his presence. There are many ways to get there. I think you just live a righteous life. You live a perfect life. You love people. You care for people. You do all those kind of things. I said, if you can live a perfect life and never sin, okay. I don't think you're going to be able to do that, though. I said, have you ever been mad? Well, of course I've been mad. Have you ever been angry enough to strike somebody? Well, hasn't everybody? You're guilty. <laughs> what do you mean? I can't be mad at anybody? No. I can't strike anybody in anger? No. That's a sin. Jesus said that's murder. You thou shalt not commit murder. Murder is one of the commandments. You broke the commandment, you're out. I'm sorry. And they look at me dumbfounded like I've come up with some crazy thing from a Cracker Jack box. That's what the Bible teaches. Right? He is the only way. Isn't that very arrogant for him to say that? Well, if, if it's true, it's not arrogant, is it? It's like me telling somebody I could jump in the high jump six feet back in the day. I can jump six feet. Yeah, it's kind of arrogant, plumber. Well, if you can do it, <laughs> then it's not arrogance. Right? He is the only way. And I wrote in the notes, Confucius didn't pay the price. He didn't die. He didn't pay the price. Mohammed didn't pay the price. Buddha didn't pay the price. The Virgin Mary didn't pay the price. You cannot pay your own price. Jesus paid the price. He is the only one who paid the price. And I was ruminating in my head. I wonder what it's going to be like for Bill Gates at the judgment seat. Bill Gates shows up there. Lives his life. Walks up into the Lord's presence. Can I get into heaven? Well... Did you know my son Jesus? Well, I definitely heard his name. You know, there was this stuff around Christmas, around the tree. I mean, it looks like some manger scene. We always put that up. We sang some good songs. Did you know Jesus? Or did you know of Jesus? <laughs> yeah, but look what I did. I did all these great things. You know what? We brought food to people who didn't have food. We brought medical care to people who didn't have medical care. We brought all of these wonderful things. We brought technology to the planet. We put satellites all over the world. So communication could happen all over the world. <laughs> and say the Lord, like, did you know my son? <laughs> Why do you keep asking me that? Because that's the only question. <laughs> did you know my son? Your wealth, filthy rags. Your deeds, filthy rags. I got enough money up here. I don't need your money. I can heal my own people. I don't need you to heal my people. Who paid the price for you? And Bill Gates says, well, I'm a Buddhist. Buddha lived a great life, not a perfect life. You want to see Buddha? Take a look down there. Yeah, way down here. Let me give you a telescope. <laughs> Looks kind of warm. <laughs> he didn't pay the price. Jesus paid the price. Romans 3, 24 to 26 being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, who was dis God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, a ransom in his own blood. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. His righteousness at the present time so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God took out all of the punishment for sin of the world on Christ because sin deserves death. Wages of sin is death. 
He was just because he took all the sins of the world and put it on Christ. Therefore, paid for, paid in full. And because of that, he can justify those who have faith in Jesus. I can look to Jesus and say, you know what, I'm not wealthy. You know what, I didn't help a whole bunch of people. I didn't bring technology all over the world. I didn't do any of that stuff. The only thing I have is Jesus. <laughs> That's it. That's the only thing I can plead. I plead the blood. And I was joking earlier about great songs. There's power in the blood because his blood is what paid for our redemption and we can shout, I'm redeemed, like those wonderful songs that we sung earlier. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that old hymn that I had to pull out of Nowhere, I hadn't heard that in a long period of time. Maybe it's new to you, but redeemed because we see and know the blood. What should our reaction be to that? We should be thankful for being redeemed. Our whole life should be filled with thankfulness, regardless of the trials and tribulations in life. That's only a passing moment in time, but you're going to be redeemed. Forever, eternally. Psalm 107, that great psalm. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love and kindness is everlasting. We have that, we say that. It's in all sorts of songs. But the rest of that psalm is awesome. Verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east to the west, from the north and to the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region, the Jews did. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them by a straight way to go to an inhabited city through the promised land. And what does the psalmist say they should do? Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for the wonders to the sons of men, for he has satisfied a thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. He took care of Israel in the wilderness and those who went into the promised land went in with great joy. And so I write in the notes, we should be proud to be part of the redeemed. We should speak about it with thankfulness. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If there's one thing and you're driving by the church here with somebody in the car and you look at the sign and it says the redeemed, tell the person in the car with you, the kids, the grandkids, whoever it is, do you know I am redeemed? I'm going to go to heaven because... My price has been paid by the Lord. That any mistake I have ever made in my life, any mistake that I will make today, and any mistake that I will make in the future, He has paid the price for. I am redeemed. Let us say so. Let's not shrink from saying so because, well, you know, I don't want to preach, sound preachy to them. No, I don't want to mention it to them because, you know, they may think I'm a Jesus freak or something like that. Let them know where you stand. Let the redeemed say so. That's what the psalmist said. Paul to the Colossians, Colossians 1, 10 through 13. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of steadfastness and patience. Doing what? Joyously giving thanks to the Father. Why, Paul? Why should we give thanks? For he rescued us from the domain of darkness, and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We were kidnapped by the evil one, and we were rescued, and we ran from the evil one's house. And we run into the arms of our beloved Savior. And you know what he does? He grabs us, holds us tight, 
loves us like the child who has been restored back to him who was taken away unjustly. That's why we walk in a manner worthy and that's why we're thankful because we all live through that scene. We all were rescued in our life. No one was perfect. When was the moment in your life when you realized he rescued you? How old were you? Were you five? Were you 10? Were you 15? I was 27. I hope all of us and everybody listening to this message has been rescued. If you don't remember when that time was, maybe you need to have a conversation with your pastor about rescue, ransom, redemption, and call to be returned and call others to return. The psalmist, Psalm 130, talked about the call to return. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If you're holding me to that perfect standard, I can't stand. I'm in trouble. There's no way I can make the grade. I'm not good enough. I'm not perfect. Well, neither were we. Neither are we today. But the next line, verse 2 of Psalm 130, But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman of the morning. And then the psalmist says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. There is hope for those in darkness and in the depths of despair. There is forgiveness available to you. There is loving kindness waiting for you. There is peace when you come to Jesus in faith. All these things are open. Our redemption is complete if you are in Christ. Israel's yet to come, and they look forward. To it. The Jews will eventually see Jesus. They will see him coming on the clouds. Luke writes in Luke 21 They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. And when they see these things begin to take place, Luke instructs them Stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Our redemption is already with us. In Acts 3, 19 to 21, Peter, Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you into your life. There's hope if we repent and return. Israel must repent and willingly return to God. If you are not in Christ, you need to repent also. You need to change your mind. You need to think differently. You need to realize that the sin uncovered is the sin that leads you to eternal hell and damnation. And the only way into the God, God's presence is through the Lord Jesus Christ and to take his sacrifice, his ransom, his rescue on our behalf. I remember reading Job and reading through all the trials of, that Job had, all the bad advice that he got, all the things that were mentioned from his, quote, friends, unquote, including his wife, who gave him great and excellent advice. Curse God and die. Not exactly good counsel from his bride at that point. And in the midst of his trial, he says, I know my Redeemer lives, and he will stand on the earth in that day. I know I will be ransomed. I know I will be rescued. I'm not going to listen to all you guys who are telling me that it's all my fault. You know, Jesus said he was blameless. God said he was blameless, Job was. 
God said he was perfect. Wow, what a testimony of this guy's life. And he knew that his Redeemer would be there. So we should praise. And this should be a message of praise. Because we are part of the redeemed. If you are in Christ, you are part of the redeemed. 1 Peter 1, 3-5 Praise to be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead into an inheritance that could never perish, never spoil, never fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. If you are redeemed, you can stand at the last time and have the gates of heaven open up to you, just like walking into that dollar general. Zip. Welcome home. And we should be in great joy and praise that we are part of the redeemed because we recognize the sacrifice on our behalf. And we just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for loving us and dying on the cross for us that we can be redeemed. And Father God, we thank you for your plan. We thank you for the plan of salvation that included the names of us here who walk into heaven and will one day with great joy and praise. And I think back to that passage of scripture and Revelation. Revelation 5, when the saints are all there around the throne, worshiping the Lamb. All the tribes, all the nations, all people singing in great harmony of praise to you, praise to the Lamb for his rescue and his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I thank you that you revealed to me at age 27 that I was part of the redeemed. I thank you on behalf of every member here in the church who remembers when they understood that wonderful, joyous fact and looked to the cross and said, thank you, Lord, for dying for me. May everybody listening to the message here or later on our YouTube channel remember the day when they looked at that cross and said, Lord, save me. And Lord, put a passionate concern in their heart if they feel like they are separated from you. If they watch their life and they see separation, they see sin in their life, they see continual lack of peace in their life, I pray for them, Lord, that you would show them what true peace is. That you would rescue them in their present situation and say there's another way to live. You can live differently, holy, set apart, be blameless, and walk into heaven one day and say thank you Jesus for loving us and dying on the cross for us. And we pray this prayer of thankfulness in Jesus name. Amen. The rescue for sinners and the ransom from heaven. A song about redemption and being part of the redeemed. It's great to add that at the end. Hope you guys enjoyed the, the message today. I'm going to put a challenge out to you. When I get it posted up on Facebook, forward it to somebody. This is a message if you've got kids or grandkids that are not part of the kingdom that they need to hear. They need to hear that you're part of the redeemed and say, you know what, instead of giving me a present for my birthday, just watch this message. Instead of giving me a Christmas present, just watch this message and then let's have a conversation about it. That's the greatest present you could ever give me. Right? Do that. Use this. That's the message we need to take to the community. And so tonight we're going to do prayer and praise night. We'll see you back here at 6 o'clock for praise, for prayer. Still need one person or I'm going to have a voluntold instead of a volunteer to pray that extra slot you know that I still need to fill. 
But we're going to joylessly praise and, and, pray, and pray to the Lord tonight at 6. So we'll see you then. Lord God, I do thank you so much for this precious people, for the beloved here in this community church. Bless them, Lord, those who couldn't be here today. Lord, bless them, keep them safe, give them safe travels back to us, restore those back to health who need restoration to health. We look forward to having the whole crew here together again. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Jeffrey Plummer. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. Our sermon video is available on our website, which is www.cbccne.org. On that website, you will find sermon video as well as a blog that I write each week to our fellowship here at the church. At the top of the website in the corner, you can see all of those links that can get to that information. You can also learn about our church with our church history in the About page to be able to find out what we're all about here in Cambridge, Nebraska. Again, I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.